hey everyone, uh, great to see you. Uh, we are both super excited to be talking to you. We have had the great pleasure of working together for now three years-ish. Yeah, three years. Uh, I first met Ayush when he was working on HackFS uh, in one of the, the, I think it was the first HackFS that we ever held. It was an early hackathon uh, through ETH Global. And uh, he and Sushmit uh, were building the first iteration of what became uh, Huddle Zero One was it Cadbury at the time? Cadbury, yeah. Yeah, they were awesome. They were a great team. They built a really, really awesome hack, and then they went on to uh, do the whole accelerator route and build a company and build an amazing team. You'll hear all about the story tomorrow. What I wanted to do is create a bit of space today to hear what you want us to talk about. Uh, there's some stuff that we want to talk about. Um, Ayush wants to ask me about uh, some of the early time in building. Um, IPFS and in building protocol labs and kind of like going through like w the really hard things of building a company from scratch and the really hard things of building a project from scratch. Um, but uh, I also wanted to hear what's top of mind for you and make it a very interactive conversation. So um, I'm going to just start by like sourcing s a bunch of questions from the audience. We're not going to answer them immediately, but it'll give us a sense of what you want to hear um, and then we'll meander through those, those topics. So if you have a question for us, uh, raise your hand. Um, so uh, just a general question about what do you think about the UX of crypto? Uh, okay. How do you think we could reduce the friction for a retail user instead of just devs per se, right? And okay. what do you think of uh, account abstraction and the pitfalls right now uh, to implement it? And how do you see it scaling in the future? Okay, great. So st stuff about UX and account abstraction. Uh, more questions? Uh, how do you envision uh, putting ML models uh, on chain? Like through ZKML, optimistic ML. How do we envision putting what on chain? Uh, machine learning models on chain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yep. We can talk a, a little bit about machine learning. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, Juan. So uh, my question is related to IPC. So it launched uh, just recently. So like, what do you see coming up? Like some projects that you want uh, builders to build, and uh, what do you think uh, could uh, like it could impact uh, in you? So we'll, we'll touch on IPC and early applications. Any other questions? Anything about like the founder journey? Oh, there's one over here. Uh, yeah, so my question was a bit of a general question. Uh, I wanted to talk about Web3 social, right? I'm not satisfied with the kind of social media apps that we see in Web3 these days. Cool. And you guys are sort of the pioneers for a field like that because obviously storage and communication are the fundamental pillars of any social media application. So cool. just touch on Web3 social, what do you think could be better? And can we see something like really uh, incredible and like something that's gonna stay for a very long time? So because we don't see social apps, uh, they run its course very fast, right? Especially in Web3. Yep. So yeah, just touch on that subject and let me know what your thoughts are from from both of y'all. Great, sounds good. It was really cool to see NFT tickets over here for this conference. Um, I'm curious, what does a truly Web3 native IRL experience or conference looks like in your mind? All right, I think we those are a lot of pretty good things. So do you want to start off with uh, the, the beginning that you wanted to go through, like the starting of IPFS and so on? So uh, uh, I, I watched a podcast with one uh, of one and where he mentioned about a point, I think he really talks about that, uh, is what I've observed is, uh, the journey of IPFS one and the journey of Filecoin. And I remember you saying once that when you were building IPFS, in terms of even the financial, you were almost not even zero, but in negative. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So would love to understand that journey where, how it happened. I remember you mentioned that you were also with Ali at that time. And what was the whole journey like? And yeah, because yeah. a lot of people resonate with that. Yeah, so this is kind of like an interesting part of the story of starting Protocol Labs and starting IPFS and, and so on. Um, so... Uh, before starting Protocol Labs, um, I was working on a on another startup that failed. Uh, before that one, I was working on a, on a games company that had like modest success, built uh, getting to uh, some success with the games. Uh, we were making like location oriented monster catcher game way before Pokemon Go. Uh, I was like you know the first mobile phone um, monster catcher. You could, it was very you know inspired by things like Pokemon and others. Um, it was called Geomon. You can still find uh, find it online. You can find like um, trailers for it and so on. Uh, from that, I, I um, ended up uh, going to that. That company ended up being sold to Yahoo, and um, from that, I I went to start a company called Athena, uh, where we wanted to 
map all of human knowledge and be able to organize a tree of dependencies and be able to figure out how to install the knowledge in your brain as fast as possible, meaning how to figure out the dependency tree from what you know today to what you want to learn and navigate you through that path to uh, enable you to learn uh, and also personalize that learning path, uh, finding explanations that, are, that work well for you, finding explanations that tune for your style, explanations that also build on all the concepts that you already know. Um, so at the time, this was uh, in an era, like right around when Coursera and Udacity and other things like that were getting started. Uh, if anybody has used Khan Academy, there used to be like this really cool um, uh, concept map uh, as well that was kind of similar in, in style to this idea. I think they ended up removing that, but, but that was kind of like the idea, the package manager for your mind. So you can say, hey, I want to learn, I don't know, machine learning, and you can then trace all, the, all of the concepts that mean machine learning, then trace down to you know, dependencies like um, probability theory, or um, computer science in general, or um, you know, uh, programming, linear algebra, or things like that. And uh, so I started that company with um, a number, a number of uh, friends who uh, have gone on to do like really, really amazing things. Um, this included uh, Ali Yahya, who's now a GP at Andreessen. So this was uh, a failure. Like we worked super hard on this company for. Um, I worked on it for, like, I guess, two years. Um, others worked on it for about a year and, and gave up. We couldn't raise money. Uh, there was a time when uh, Udacity and Coursera had sucked out all the money from that was going to go to education. So we would. We were also not very good at raising money yet, so we didn't know how to do it. Um, and though we were building a product and we had some early um, uh, traction with some users in, in, in our, our university, uh, it wasn't yet um, good enough to be a good product that people actually wanted to use or that had any kind of larger scale traction or success and certainly not something that we ended up being able to raise money for. So, you know, we were bootstrapping for ourselves. We were paying, um, we were like working off of our savings and we just like burned all of our money down through zero into the negative. Like we were uh, in credit card debt and so on. Um, and we got to the point where like we just couldn't keep going and we ended up having to, having to stop. And that was an extremely hard um, part. Um, now, you know, I, at the time, I uh, planned to eventually return to be able to build Athena. Uh, as I describe it right now, I'm sure that some of you were like, oh man, I want that. Like, why doesn't that exist? Let's, let's go do it. Let's, let's go build it uh, sometime in the future. Um, uh, but anyway, I went, ended up uh, navigating into building other kinds of knowledge um, mapping tools or other kinds of knowledge uh, organizing tools. And that's what ended up getting me closer to data set package management. Um, and that's what seeded the beginnings of what became IPFS. And so I, by that point, I was, we were kind of like, had called it quits in Athena. We just, it didn't work out. The kind of like team disbanded and, and left and went to different directions. Uh, some of us were like super beyond broke. We were like uh, in, in credit card debt and we were figuring out what to do next. And um, I, I remember at the time, uh, it, you know, doing a little bit of consulting here and there to try and like crawl back up uh, and, and get out of that and be able to like figure out what's next. And at the time I, I worked on, um, so on this project that eventually became IPFS. And along the way, I was already getting into Bitcoin and, and figuring out um, cryptocurrency was finally gonna break through the barrier of adoption um, and that led to thinking about Filecoin and building Filecoin, and um, those two ideas kind of com came together, and it made sense, because IPFS on its own is extremely hard to build a business around. Uh, you could go and try to monetize it like Cloudera or the typical open source type of business, but it seemed like unlikely to work that well, at, at least at the time. And, and so once I sort of like found the beginnings of Filecoin, I was like, oh, actually this might actually work really well. We can create a cryptocurrency and monetize this part of the of the network this way, um, and then separately, you know, have IPFS as a proper open source project that um, you know has no monetization in it, and that kind of gave enough um, structure to have something that was investable, and that happened to coincide with a really good moment in uh, Silicon Valley where um, Sam Allen had just gone to YC uh, to lead it, and I think he had maybe it was a second, I think it was a second program that he led. I don't remember. Um, he put out a really good um, uh, RFP, sorry, RFS, Request for Startups, 
that was the most exciting one that I'd ever seen, um, way cooler than the prior RFSs from, from, um, from YC. Uh, it was really oriented towards deep tech, towards things that were going to make the world a, a drastically better place, things like improvements in transportation and AI and, um, and cryptocurrency and blockchains were part of that and so on. So I was like, oh, perfect. Like this actually ended up matching up pretty well. So that I applied to YC then, um, got in, and uh, ended up getting a bit of funding. And that was the beginning of Protocol Labs. And, and then that went off to, uh, from there I was kind of like back on having enough uh, funding to be able to like pay myself and then start hiring other people um, and then eventually build a team. And from there, uh, you know, kind of grow into, into what Protocol Labs is today. So like, that was like a, a super um, tricky and hard and so on. However, it was not the hardest thing ever. Uh, it wasn't actually that hard. And the reason why it wasn't that hard is that it turns out that the world is, like, it, it, the world is surprisingly well structured to support you through moments like that. I mean, this kind of support varies across the world and not everybody has the same um, luxuries of being able to have like good support structures with friends and family and so on. Um, but um, if you have an internet connection and if you have learned a lot, you can go and build, you, you can go and, and um, do some amount of consulting work here and there. You can go and find possible ways of like scrounging some amount of capital uh, to then kind of, uh, but, but still preserving a lot of your time to then be able to look for what's, what's next. And so it was like definitely tricky and hard and probably for a lot of people sounds really scary. Uh, for me, it wasn't that scary uh, and I kind of like made it, made it past that. Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to that. I think part of, um, part of why we wanted to cover that is like, a lot of people are worried about, um, you know, taking a leap and going to start something new, or, or worried about like, um, you know, maybe you see all these very successful companies and you think that they're always super successful, that they never went through something really hard or, or really um, um, just difficult, yeah, something really difficult or um, concerning like that. And no, it, it, this happens in tons of companies and tons of founder journeys where you go through like extremely difficult moments, um, whether it's right at the beginning or through the middle. Um, I find that it gets harder as you go. Like the, the more successful something gets, the more pressure there is to make it succeed. And like the more difficult uh, things get, difficult here with like some sense of um, a lot of duty to, to making the thing work. Um, but yeah, any other yeah, thoughts? I think this was YC 2014, right? Uh, yeah, 2014. Yeah. I think we can now combine the questions one of the uh, other people. I think one thing, since we're talking about the Web3 conference, I think uh, one of the person in the back, Prashant, asked a question regarding what's an ideal Web3 conference like in terms of we had an NFT ticket this time to enter and stuff. So according to you, what's an ideal Web3 conference? Yeah. Um, yeah, it definitely varies. So, so the question also specifies IRL. So, you know, being, being in person and so on. Um, I mean, I definitely think like ticketing and all that structure should, should be using NFTs. Um, you should probably do staking for attendance. It kind of varies by different places, but I think staking is a pretty useful structure. Um, I think we should be using, um, you know, fully decentralized stuff to host the websites and host all the tooling. Um, we don't have good, this will be a good segue to the social question. We don't have good social um, products yet in Web3. So, you know, we're stuck using um, Telegram and stuck using a lot of other products that are really nice and really good, um, but not actually, you know, proper Web3. And it would be great to have fully self-hosted entire infrastructure for everything related to an event um, entirely working on, on Web3. So that, I think that was, that's kind of like what I would imagine the most. Um, I am excited also, not in I IRL, but I am excited about um, events in metaverse type environments. I think this is something that hasn't been explored that much yet. Like there are some, some beginnings of explorations, but I think there's an enormous untapped um, potential there. Um, who here has played video games? Cool, most of you. Who here enjoys playing video games? Like especially like immersive games. Yeah, a lot of you, right? So um, you probably like hanging out with your friends online and hanging out and doing some um, uh, playing around together. Uh, there's likely a way of creating that kind of an experience for many kinds of events, whether it's hanging out or whether it's like um, going to like s seeing some kind of art piece together, you know, whether it's a movie or like a 3D version of a movie or something like that, um, or whether it's a conference or a meeting or something, like those kinds of things. Uh, I think there's untapped potential there. 
it's fairly difficult to get it working, and a lot of the tech is still getting figured out. But I, I would, uh, for the intrepid hackers out there that are interested in 3D or interested in um, metaverse type environments, um, I would suggest that going that way. Yeah, I think this is a good segue to the question by Akshat regarding the state of Web3 social right now, and where do you see it? Uh, how do we improve it? And then we can merge that with the question of, I think, account abstraction and the ease of access to onboarding into Web3. Yeah, so social is super, super um, important here. Uh, social networks are some of the most um, widely used products around. They're tremendously valuable and powerful, right? Like, think of all of the utility that you get from social networks day to day. Um, you know, starting from the simplest social networks, like text messages to... You know, the phone network for sure, but also things like Telegram or Slack, you know, the social network for work, or things like GitHub, the social network for open source. Um, you know, when you think about GitHub, it was very successful because of the social features, um, not, not because of, you know, n just code hosting. Um, it was code hosting plus very strong collaboration features. And so um, most of the products that we humans use day to day have huge elements of collaboration and coordination and lots of different kinds of social elements. And it turns out that when you want to make millions to hundreds of millions of people collaborate through something, you end up having to create hundreds of millions of little objects of data and you have to update them really quickly. Like you send out a tweet and you know people are gonna like look at that tweet, you have to record that that you happened, you have to, rec you know, if somebody retweets something or likes it, you have to record that that happened. Then, then that causes more, like now there's a retweet as an element. So you, it, it's the kind of structure that just generates a ton of little objects of data. The, when you add it up, it's not actually that big in terms of the total volume of bytes that you would have to store, but it's a ton of little objects that, um, that are made dynamically where you want really fast, snappy responses. This is really, really hard to do in full Web3 today. We don't have good infrastructure for that kind of stuff. Um, we, in the IPFS community, we've been hacking on this kind of thing for, for a long time, building ma many different kinds of projects and prototypes uh, to enable this. Um, I'm pretty excited about some new generation tools like Tableland and um, Polybase and others that are um, database, Web3 oriented database things. Um, but I think, the, I think the way to crack this nut is, is to go all the way to scaling blockchains completely. Um, and this is where you know IPC uh, comes in. Uh, from my perspective, in order for blockchains and for Web three to succeed, we need to get full a full application like a whole social network to be able to operate entirely on Web three primitives, which to me means putting most of that on chain. Maybe the, the static assets could potentially be off chain, but I think we can scale chains to have all of the operations. And I say that knowing the orders of magnitude here. We're talking about you know, 10 to the power of maybe you know, 12 or 13 objects. Uh, it's an enormous amount of objects that you might have to track, um, you know, especially for all of the people in the world, for massive scale uh, social networks. Um, and this is where the design of IPC comes from. Um, the design of IPC comes from being able to imagine a world where you have that scale of objects being written to um, to a, a, a blockchain infrastructure. Uh, so that's why it's hierarchical, that's why it has a tree, and it's meant to kind of be able to fan out and recursively um, enable lots of subnets and so on. Uh, that's, that's sort of like where it comes from. So m my sense of what's holding back social applications is truly the infrastructure. The infra isn't there. Um, all of the, all of the groups that have tried to do Web3 social end up having to write huge amounts of infrastructure for themselves. Farcaster is building a bunch of infrastructure for themselves. Um, Blue Sky is building a bunch of infrastructure for themselves. Like all of these groups end up having to like reshape the tech underneath them because it does the, the stuff isn't there for them to use. Um, and if you if you say oh well you know you don't have to do that you can do progressive decentralization you like put a little bit on chain and put most of it off chain. Yeah, bullshit. I don't. I don't buy it. It's not real Web three. Most of the, if if you have like all of this stuff inside of a database that only you control and other people can't have access to, that's not really. That's not doesn't have the right properties. Doesn't have the permissionlessness of innovation. The that doesn't really enable other groups with other applications to use that use it and so on. Um, so I really think we have to go all the way to enable that kind of infrastructure 
and then we're going to be able to truly make social networks um, scale. So that's that's my sense of like what's holding them back. So I don't think it's product. Like a, a lot of people in the Web3 space know how to make good products. A lot of people have tried to make pretty pretty nice looking, um, beautiful um, social network style products in Web3. They just haven't been able, like just when you start trying to build the data model, you have to contort into extremely complex environments and you end up kind of like drowning in complexity of, in, of writing infrastructure code. Um, and so we just should go solve that first and then build social networks. That's my two cents. Yeah, I think since you mentioned about that, the infrastructure uh, is the major place where we should focus on. But I think coming to the clients, like something like Parcaster and uh, apps on Lens, for example, Orb and all the others, some of them are used as well. Uh, I think the question there was on how do we improve the accessibility for a normal user, like an account abstraction was one of the uh, things which was pointed out by one of the person here. So what's your take on that? How do we improve? Uh, um, so I, I don't have a lot of strong opinions on the short term um, designs of account abstraction. I'm sure that I would if I read through all of the specs, I would probably have a bunch of strong opinions. Um, but from my sense, um, we really need accounts in blockchains to be able to be interchangeable with any smart contract. They need to be able to um, be fully composable. Um, they also need to be instantiated by not just any smart contract in that chain, but they need to be able to be represented by collections of smart contracts across many chains. Like that's a level of a kind of abstraction that nobody's writing about right now. Um, it, it really is just pointers in computer science, right? It's just you need to be able to have something uh, like connected to something else, and that something else needs needs to be able to be represented in a wide variety of ways. And we're just kind of working through a bunch of shortcuts that the industry took early on because it kind of like made sense at the time. When you were building a product or a new technology, you have to cut so many corners in order to bu build the first version and ship it uh, quickly. And you don't really know at that point which corners that you're cutting um, are really going to be turn out to be like a problem that you have to go back and fix. And which corners that you're cutting are actually totally fine to cut and you didn't need to um, work through anyway. Sometimes you can have an intuition, sometimes you can have some, some strong educated guesses, um, but oftentimes you'll end up returning to something that you didn't predict, um, or things that you predict that you thought were gonna be problems turn out not to be. So still when building products and technology, I would encourage you to like get to MVPs quickly, get to product market fit quickly, iterate with customers and users, and, and scale, um, and then eventually kind of uh, refine. Something, a, a good principle, a good design principle that I tend to follow here is to try and build escape hatches or try to like build abstraction layers to be able to, um, whenever invariably you're gonna come back and, and flesh something out, um, that's easy to do as opposed to you know extremely difficult to untangle. I think the account abstraction problem is in part there because the, the, um, the Ethereum team in the beginning uh, didn't build um, enough of an abstraction layer around abstraction, uh, uh, around accounts to then be able to later on build the very specific things that we need today. And, and so a lot of the work is going into in untangling um, what accounts mean and so on. And, and we're gonna end up with like this problematic environment where like half the tools support it and a bunch of tools don't and, and so on. Um, but you know, it's like among, that's one problematic thing when, in re when on, the up on the flip side, um, Ethereum got so many other things right that you know we don't have to worry about today because like they did it was a pretty good design. I think there are three questions. Uh, one was uh, on the on-chain ML, and then on IPC. And then I have a last question, and then we can, yeah. Yeah. So on on on-chain ML, um, so I think a few things here. One is uh, you should be able to use um, blockchain infrastructure to organize a massive cloud to power. Um, ML, uh, ML system, so that means either for training or for inference uh, and so on. And you should be able to, and, and you know, ma many groups are going after and, and, and working on that. You know, Jensen is one of them. There's, there's a number of others. Um, you should also be able to use blockchain infrastructure to build a strong provenance and governance layer around ML models. So some of the hardest problems ahead of us are being able to truly know what algorithms were run to train a model, what data was fed into that model, um, what prompts are being are, are 
is somebody trying to invoke. Um, and if you add a lit, if you sprinkle a little bit of provenance and you know hash linked oriented um, data structures to track all of that information, you can end up with a much better governance structure for building ML systems and running extremely powerful AI models in the future. And I think this is going to become more and more and more and more important. So I, you know, if you're interested in ML and you're interested in blockchain and you're trying to like think of those two connecting, um, I think this this problem is a very very interesting one where you figure out a good way to create like systems that communities could govern well um, by just doing like the metadata provenance tracking around a model. It's not actually a fundamentally like it's not an extremely difficult problem in terms of the tech or the science or anything like that. It's just kind of like hard formats work of designing the right formats and the right um, data structures to to construct those those little bits of provenance. So I think if we can do that, we can end up with like much stronger and safer ML systems. Uh, and then the, the th last thing I will mention there is um, I think you know for a while already for many years we've been in the horizon of being able to build ML agents that are invoked through blockchains. We're starting to see the first versions of those. I'm sure that like some people are running some pretty large ones already. Um, I think this is A, super interesting and super powerful, and B, super dangerous, like really super dangerous. Because you, if, you, if you think of like putting a crypto wallet in control of like some LLM, and the LLM is just like buying compute power for itself and just you know continuing to run. And the LLM is still not you know intelligent enough yet to have any kind of like real agency. It's just kind of doing whatever the prompts tell it to do. Or if you you know somebody writes like some for loop that nobody can stop. Like now you have an LLM running rampant. Like a, you know think of like having a bulldozer out in the streets like just ramming into into like houses or whatever. Like you could do that with LLMs encrypted today, so like don't do that. Don't don't build don't throw like rampant LLMs on on the world. Um, and and my sense is like if people end up doing this, um, it'll lead to like really fast attacks on the entire blockchain industry, where um, governments are going to come down hard on blockchains because like you just can't have a rogue ML system like wrecking havoc. Um, and so I would like just don't do that. It's bad. It's dangerous, and it's going to hurt the Web3 industry. Now the optimistic part of that is if you can if we can figure out the governance structure around it and we can figure out how to predict whether or not a prompt is something good to run or not, then you can build pretty sophisticated intelligent contracts. So I think you know way beyond smart contracts, in contracts that, that truly um, benefit and serve some set of communities or parties that want to engage with it, but it's really a tool. It's not like a rogue optimizer of some sort. It's just a tool that is responding to um, the simple invocations and you have a strong governance structures around it. So that's kind of like where I think some interesting intersections between AI and ML um, exist. Uh, maybe I'll touch a little bit on the IPC question and then I'll reach into you. So um, the question was, um, what are early interesting IPC applications? Um, so like I mentioned, before the social one is is a, a really a, a really interesting one where I think like starting to build beginnings of social networks would be really really cool. Um, it'll still be difficult today even with with IPC um, because there's a lot of pieces to a social network. Um, I think games might be a much easier one to go for, um, and you can think of like ordering games by difficulty of implementation. So you can start you know in the first part with like a you know a static game where you just have some static bundles and all you have to get consensus on is like a leaderboard and maybe some accounts to be able to run the game. And so like that's an easy version. The next thing after that is like board games, you know, highly asynchronous. They don't have to, um, you, the lat you don't have to worry too much about the latency. You know, a second or a few seconds is like sufficient. Um, and you can store the entire state of all of the games in an IPC subnet. Um, and if, you know, you run out of space there, you just scale up to more subnets. And so you can build like, you know, chess and all of the, whatever board games you want that way. And there's a lot of other games that are effectively board games. They're like you know turn-based games um, that that will fit on on the same kind of engine. Uh, then after that, I would go for some like more interesting, faster collaboration or fa faster faster playtimes. So I would lo start looking at things like 
first-person shooters. Um, like I have the goal of like r actually running an FPS game server in an IPC subnet. Like that's like a hard goal that we want to be able to do. Um, and you know, it's it's you know, you need like 30 um, 30 ticks a second or like 60 ticks a second, and that's totally doable. Uh, you just have to organize the structure. Um, when you when you think about what a an FPS game server is, it's just doing consensus. It's saying there's a set of programs around that all need to agree on who sent what instruction at what time and how do you order them uh, to make sure that like the game makes sense. And that's consensus. It just it has to because of the latencies, you can't like round robin who creates the block. You just cannot do that. So you have to elect a single leader to just run all of the consensus during that entire time. But because you're not running an enormous financial infrastructure, you don't have to worry about DOS very much. Because like if someone DOSes your FPS, like you know, big deal, whatever. Like um, get a new game server. Um, you know, if, if somebody DOSes your monetary system as a country, that's a big deal. But like somebody DOSing your your FPS, not a, not a big deal. Now, where does the consensus part come in? The consent, sorry, the, where does the blockchain part come in? That comes into making sure the game server is verifiable, so you can start doing like pretty interesting things. You don't have to trust the server to behave correctly. You just have to trust it to like be available and like move quickly. Um, and you can connect that FPS now to an in-game economy that you put in a in a subnet higher in the tree that has higher levels of security, and you know it's not you know a game server gunning super fast. Um, and then you know if you can do an FPS game well, then the next thing is like an RTS game or an MMORPG. And like then that would be like super awesome, right? Like think of like an entire thing like WoW or um, uh, or whatever, like built entirely on this stuff. Like that's where we're headed with with stuff like IPC. And so like that's um, these are I, I think games are like a good first range of applications. Now separate from that, if for the folks that are less interested in games, things like um, computer or data networks I think would be pretty valuable. So being able to run large scale compute pipelines upon things like think of Jupyter notebooks and being able to like issue jobs like very small little jobs um, being able to run docker containers like there, there's a super hacky way of doing this um, uh, like you, you can you can likely do this by um, one one way of approaching this is like you virtualize a runtime for docker the other way that you could like sort of get it working is that you like compile a very lightweight Linux into wasm and you just run the whole thing like that. And that's horrible, right? Like super inefficient, orders of magnitude inefficient. But it's probably less orders of magnitude than zero knowledge proofs. <laughs> zero knowledge proofs are like dramatically worse. Um, but you know, that's that's like a like an interesting hack that I would love to see someone someone make. Um, you know, if you're looking for ideas for uh, the hackathon in in um, in this weekend, um, the IPC prizes actually do have quite a bit of like leeway here and and you know, create runtimes uh, or like do like awesome things like that. Like creating a, you know, Docker containers being issued through an IPC sub subnet would be really cool. Or like a Cloudflare workers type thing, um, that, that could also be be pretty awesome. So those are some of the early early applications. Nice, yeah. Last question, I'm merging two of them uh, because I think both of them are equally important. Uh, seeing some of the questions which people asked you before. So the first is that I think Huddle, Huddle took birth uh, at ETH Global Hackathon. And there are multiple projects which came out of that. They're still with me. Like it's Tarun from CoinShare, there's Parcel, uh, there is Push, there are other people like uh, who are doing some very interesting stuff. And I've been seeing that the whole builder's journey, uh, there is a good cohort of Indian founders. And I've also observed that uh, you also spend considerable time in India now for the last two years, coming here for 10 days. So uh, what has been your, uh, eval like the matrix which you have observed for these Indian founders? Um, and yeah, what's your comment on that? That's the first question. The second one is that you mentioned in one of the slides regarding companies and innovation networks and in innovation networks, you mentioned like Stanford University is a kind of an innovation network. And there was a one person who asked a question regarding that if I'm not from IIT, which is one of the premier institutes, can I also apply into that? So how can, and I went to Sta uh, Stanford uh, recently just to see, uh, and I was blown away the kind of culture, the vibe was there. So. What has been experience at Stanford and what kind of cues can uh, we take from Stanford and build innovation networks in places like India? Yeah, so uh, awesome questions there. So I'll start with the the kind of um, cohort of Indian founders in the PL network. Um, so I think here I really have to give the great kudos to ETH Global who, um, you know, when, when it, we've always been fan, 
fans of hackathons. And I've, I'd always been wanting to do a remote hackathon. And right when co I think it, COVID had hit, and we were building and launching Filecoin, and we wanted hackathons for Filecoin. And I had been to, I had seen ETH Global hackathons, and I thought they were awesome. And um, I really wanted to do a remote one with them. And it just sort of like worked out to build to build HackFS. Um, turned out to be their second remote hackathon, but they really wanted to kind of experiment with the uh, with the concept, and it was tremendously successful. And that really enabled us to connect with lots of people around the world that we otherwise wouldn't have, and especially a whole set of founders from India, um, or a lot of hackers from India, some of which ended up becoming founders of uh, founders of companies. And so that social network, the ETH Global social network, in, in effect, um, was able to connect us really well. Because um, we, we would have had a lot of interest to come and meet people here, um, but we didn't yet have a program set up to kind of run this. And so it was really great to be able to partner with ETH Global to do this. Um, so I think things like that, you know, social structures that enable, um, or, or you know, not, not just social structures, but like programs that, that, um, that can help connect people, right? Like a hackathon is a program that helps connect people that are like looking for certain um, uh, like learning experiences and fun experiences with each other in like building some hacks. It helps connect the sponsors or, or like builders of technology with those hackers to like get early adopters and things and then get feedback on their tech. Um, it helps connect the builders of those things to mentor the next generation of hackers. So like these, these programs are like really, really awesome because they, they do so much valuable stuff and they make also make it really, really fun. So there's probably a bunch of other programs kind of like that. You can think of accelerator programs as you know another version of this. Um, that's a different, very different sort of stage. So we have structured an entire kind of builder's funnel that you'll get to hear about tomorrow. Um, to, to be, and you heard about some of them today, but you'll hear more about tomorrow. Um, that just has a whole range of programs across the entire R&D pipeline to help connect and grow um, people no, in whatever stage they're they're going through, um, and so I think like th the ability to kind of lean into remote and connect br broadly with every anybody kind of enabled us to find each other. And once we did, then we just like really um, doubled down on supporting you, and we saw how awesome the stuff that you were you were making was. We saw how amazing you were as people. Like we, one of the things that I remember is um, after meeting all of you, like just. Um, I was super impressed with both how smart and dedicated and thoughtful you were, but also how like good you were. Like we, as a as the PL network, put a very strong emphasis on people that are like trying to build good technology, technology that is gonna make the world a better place, that's gonna solve some hard problems. And we and it just shown through that all of you were interested in like solving hard problems for your communities and solving hard problems that you cared about. Um, and that was just awesome for us. We that just enabled us to. Um, feel fantastic about spending a lot of time and effort helping you um, because we wanted you to succeed in solving those problems. And so that that is kind of like what, what ena enabled the beginning. Um, but now that we have a, a cohort of Indian founders, uh, it'd be great to scale that up uh, even more. And so this is where um, a lot of our thoughts about um, investing really deeply in, in, in India and getting to know a lot of the people here, getting to connect with a lot of the folks here, um, certainly in India Blockchain Week, but in other times, uh, remotely, right? Like we, all of us spend a lot of time on the internet. Um, it's great to be here in person and, and get to hang out, um, but we can also do versions of this online. Um, we do all kinds of remote hackathons, remote um, conferences, and so on. And so through those, like we'll be able to get to know each other and, and work together on a bunch of interesting things. And now the guild, like we'll, you know, the open source guild that we're, that we're starting, so that'll be, um, there'll be another cool program that we can add to the to the to the set. Yeah, yeah. I think the second one was uh, on the uh, innovation network point uh, of what you had learned at the Stanford uh, and how we can take a cue in the Indian universities in general. Yeah. So um, innovation networks. I'll, I'll start by defining what an innovation network is. It's a weird thing that isn't really written about yet. Um, an innovation network is a system of organizations and people and structures that um, organize the process of innovation better than the surrounding environment. So what I mean, that, that sounds very vague, and, and unfortunately it is, um, because innovation networks are pretty different. 
Uh, you can think of something like Silicon Valley itself as an innovation network. You can think of the Web3 community and industry as an innovation network itself, right? Even though it's remote and doesn't have a place or something like that. And nobody runs it, right? Like it's a decentralized um, emergent phenomenon. Um, some innovation networks are um, more centralized, like YC. YC is an innovation network that is like, you know, has a specific company with a specific set of programs and so on. Uh, something like a university is somewhere in between that because there, there certainly is an entity that's sort of centralized, but universities are like these weird beasts that have lots of different sub-entities and groups, and they're like these large kind of organisms that, um, that, have that are optimizing for fairly different things within, within themselves. So I, I, I'm talking about this concept because for me it was a very important eye-opening thing to compare the success rate of single tech companies to an innovation network. So my goal has been for you know, a very long time to try and solve this innovation chasm thing of like trying to enable more science to be done faster, more technology to be done faster so that we can get to radically improving technology, like things that make our lives dramatically better. When you look back over the last few hundred years, society has gotten tremendously better for everybody around the world. Well, I mean, not, not everybody, but like most people um, that come in contact with science and technology um, and their products ha has had their lives be dramatically improved um, relative to kind of where things were in the past. Think of sanitation and public health and transportation and, um, and so on. And so being able to kind of like um, speed up that process, that, that R&D environment of being able to do more science and translate into more technology that can be built into more successful like solutions for people globally um, would be is like the, I think the highest leverage way of like improving the world. Um, and the problem is like it's a fairly abstract thing to try and, and improve. Um, and for a long time, I kind of admired a lot of single tech companies that 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 try to do this like, really well at scale. So the most famous one here is Bell Labs. I think that no one has ever come close to. Um, to the success of Bell Labs in, in doing this. Um, I think you know, Google, Google and Alphabet are like a, a recent example. But this is where it became like stark for me. In, in, the 20, in, in, the, in the last 20 years, Google has had the mo one of the most successful businesses on the planet, an you know, enormous amount of capital and, and cash flow and so on. Some of the smartest and most brilliant people in the world. Tons of good intentions in ton solving lots of problems. A lot of like interest in tackling lots of like great great things. Um, a structure they created the alphabet structure to go and try to pursue lots of different moonshot projects like with X and so on. And you know think of Loon and you know ton, like um, eventually Waymo and you know, they built a ton of like projects to try and be able to solve lots of things. But when you compare the output of the entire alphabet system to the output of YC. YC, in the same span of time, in a similar span of time, was able to produce dramatically more impact in R&D than Alphabet um, because it used a different structure. Instead of trying to like own everything within a single corporation that, that is like very tightly related, um, it created this environment that just supported people and organizations and companies and accelerated their journey in like one slice of the, of the journey, not even like try to do the whole thing end to end or anything like that, just kind of like accelerate one part. And YC was able to support, you know, fusion companies and plane making companies and tons of biotech companies, like drug development companies. Um, tons of amazingly valuable things have been supported by, by YC in, in the span of time that, that Alphabet was not able to, you know, have that kind of R&D success. So for me, an innovation network, an open permissionless environment um, that creates that tries to create structures and programs that people can take advantage of, um, but doesn't seek to like control the whole thing or guide the whole thing. It's a dramatically more successful way of organizing um, people and projects and and or and and teams um, to achieve like lots of R and D uh, throughput. Uh, now, this big caveat here is this could change with AI. AI could make the organization and allocation of resources dramatically faster and easier as a single centralized entity, uh, but we'll see how that, how that pans out. Uh, at least for the time being, um, I and so many other people in the PL network just thrive by being able to work with each other 
in across a very large span of fields and companies and organizations and whatnot. And it's just so much more fun to be able to like, you know, come out here and hang out with the Huddle team. Uh, they're working on all this awesome AV stuff. And then, you know, another a different day, go and hang out with the Zama folks that are building, you know, fully homomorphic encryption and so on. And the environment of the network is one where like everyone is kind of like forming their connectivity and their connective lattice. And just like any kind of university or, you know, Silicon Valley or something like that, um, you can get to, you can form like these groups and cohorts of like-minded groups within the broader network, right? Like you can kind of form affinities and bonds between substances of the network that you that you want that, that you want to um, work with or spend time with and, and so on. And that goes for like projects or companies or people. Um, I tend to divide projects and companies because projects I tend to think of as open source, large scale things that involve many groups, um, not just a single company. But yeah, this is all. Uh I think this has been fantastic, Juan. Thank you so much. I think this has been uh, a gem of information. Uh, I think I'm very excited about uh, your tomorrow's fireside chat again with Balaji. I want to stress on that again. And also next uh, uh, at the end of the day. So thank you so much, Juan, uh, for all these questions. Can we have a huge round of applause for, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.